uh, we'll have a good worship service. Good morning, everyone. It's time for us to begin this morning. I'd uh, like to welcome everybody here and, in, and our visitors we have with us today. Thank you for being here. We are hoping that this morning we can worship God in spirit and in truth and work towards the goal of learning more about his word and what he would like us to be and how we should be. Our focus is always to do what the Bible says and to follow what that says directly, no more, no less. And we pray that and hope that we will do that this morning in a worthy and pleasing manner. Brother Jerry is going to open us in prayer. Let us pray together. Dear most holy, most righteous, and all loving Father in heaven, we approach your throne of mercy and love and greatness as humble as we know how this morning, dear Father. We Thank you so much for all the many blessings that you've given us. Dear Father, we thank you for this avenue of prayer that you've given us that we can freely use at all times, knowing full well and confident that you are listening. And dear Father, we thank you so much for all that you've done for us on this earth. That it, you're, You've set up nature to run perfectly for, the, for us to be sustained in our lives. The air that we breathe, the water that we drink. Dear Father, we thank you so much for the nourishing of the earth that we've had just lately. Dear Father, we thank you for all the material blessings that you've given us, including your word that uh, we can read and have sink deep into our hearts so that we might know you and mo know Jesus and know your great love for us. We love you and Jesus so much for all that you've done for us, especially that of giving us Jesus as our Savior. Now, dear Father, we pray that we, you will go with us throughout the rest of this exercise uh, that we do today to bring glory to you and worship you. We pray that everything that we do will be in accordance with your will and be a glory to you and you'll be pleased with. Now, dear Father, we pray that you'll forgive us for the many times that we fall short in sin and guide and protect us from the evil one. This is all things we pray in Jesus' holy and precious name. Amen. I'd like to do something a little bit different than normal. I'd like to invite you to stand for the first song. Um, certainly we can sing, I stand in awe of you without standing, but... Uh, to me, it sounds better, and it's kind of good to stretch our legs and get some energy going as we start. I stand in awe. You are beautiful beyond description, too marvelous for words, too wonderful for comprehension, like nothing ever seen or heard. Who can grasp your infinite wisdom? Who can fathom the depth of your love? You are beautiful beyond description. 
perception, majesty enthroned above, and I stand, I stand. Next, we'll sing, All Hail the Power of Jesus' Name. All hail the power of Jesus' name, let angels prostrate fall, bring forth the Chosen seed of Israel's race, ye ransomed from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him, Lord of all. Hail him who saves you. Scripture reading this morning is Matthew chapter 12, verse 38 through 45. Then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to, you, to it except for the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with the generation and condemn it, because they repented in the preaching of Jonah, at the preaching of Jonah. And indeed, a great, greater than Jonah is here. The Queen of the South will rise up in the judgment with the generation and condemn it. For she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and indeed, a greater than Solomon is here. When an unclean spirit goes out of, a ma out of a man, he goes through dry places, seeking rest and finds none. Then he, come, then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. 
And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it be with this wicked generation. Before the Lord's Supper, uh, we will sing, The Love of God is Greater Far. Uh, certainly, there is nothing else that would motivate somebody to do what Jesus did on the cross, except for um, really an unfathomable love, which this song describes. The love of God is greater far than tongue or pen can ever tell. It goes beyond the highest star and reaches to the lowest hell. The guilty pair bowed down with care. God gave his son to win. His erring child he reconciled and pardoned from his sin. The love of God, how rich and pure, how measure love and strong. It shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. When years of time shall pass away and earthly thrones and kingdoms fall, when men who hear refuse to pray on rocks and hills and mountains call, God's love so sure shall still endure in nurture loss and strong. Redeeming grace to Adam's race, the saints and angels' song. The love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong. It shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. Could we within the ocean fill and were the skies a parchment made? Were every star on earth a quill, and every man a scribe by trade, to write the love of God above would drain the ocean dry. Nor could the scroll contain the whole, though stretched from sky. To sky, the love of God, how rich and pure, how measureless and strong, it shall forevermore endure the saints and angels' song. Now is the time we have as a congregation to remember the great sacrifice that Jesus made for us. And as I was thinking about, I guess lately I've been trying to find the, the many different sacrifices that Jesus made in those times. And being a hot topic of today, our rights, was one that I'd thought about recently. And some that came to mind, and, and I would like to look, read from Matthew twenty six fifty two. It says, then Jesus said to him, put your sword back in its place, for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Do you think I cannot appeal to my father, and he will at once send me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? And I was thinking about that, and how much did Jesus give up in his life 
to save us. He chose to, I wouldn't say he chose to give up his rights because he didn't choose that. He chose to suspend them and not exercise them. And I think he said that in this thing. So he did that. Why? He did that to save our souls. Because more than anything in the world, money, more than government, more than anything, even me, my what I want, is more important to save souls. Because think, when he's saying that, could you imagine 12 legions of angels? What does one or two angels do in the Bible? They lay waste to cities like there's nothing. 12 legions. I think this is like the song. I think it's 10,000 angels, right? 12 legions would be close to that. That's a lot of destruction that Jesus could have called down on us the thought or just asking. And we know that he, in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus asked if there was another way. He wanted to do, he wanted, if there was a way, he was scared. He knew what he was facing. And he, but he still chose to do what was, would save our souls over anything. And I thought also about, he, he chose to leave heaven. Could you imagine being in heaven and choosing to come down here? That's pretty bad. He chose to go where there was no sin, to be in the presence and suffer at the hand of sin and suffer for our forgiveness of the sin that hurt him. So as we partake of this bread and, and the sacrifice Jesus made and, the, and him holding himself to helping us over what he could have done for himself, let's remember that now as we partake of this bread. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we come to you now, thanking you for this day, the blessings that you've given us of it. Thanking you now especially for your son Jesus, who came down to this earth and suffered great, great pain and agony that, so that we would be able to be with you in heaven someday. We ask that we would focus our minds on this sacrifice as we partake this bread which represents his body. In Jesus' name. choose now is remember his blood. Another thought that had come to my mind as I was thinking about this, and one that would be probably very difficult for me, is he chose to not defend his innocence when he was completely innocent. He allowed himself to be accused and kept silent during that time. And that's, to me, that's, if I've been accused of something I did not do, it is very, very hard for me to be silent especially when I can easily prove my innocence as Jesus could have done. But he chose that to save us. Because as he said at the end of that, but how then should the scriptures be fulfilled that it must be so? He knew that saving us was the most important thing. So as we partake of this blood, let's remember that as he did the sacrifice. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we come to you again. Thank you for this fruit of the vine that represents the blood that Jesus allowed to be poured out on, on the cross so that we would be forgiven of our sins and be able to be with you in heaven someday. We ask that we would continue to focus on that. In Jesus' name, amen. Our next song is going to be He's My King. All day long of Jesus I am singing. He my song of joy will ever be. All the while he 
keeps my heart bells ringing. That is why and everything to me. He is my king, and oh, I dearly love him. He is my king, no other is above him. All day long in rapture praise I sing. He is my savior, he is my king. Streams of love around my soul are flowing. From his heart, love's everlasting spring. That is why my faith in him I'm showing. That is why an endless song I sing. He is my king, and oh, I nearly love him. He no other is above him all day long in rapture praise I sing he is my savior he is my king in his life I'm going home to glory with the souls who trust his saving grace going home to sing and tell his story in the blessed sunshine of his face. He is my king, and oh, I nearly love him. He is my king, no other is above him. All day long in rapture praise I sing. He is my savior, he is my king. Okay, uh, before our lesson, we're going to sing Jesus is all the world to me. <clears throat> Probably noticed the theme in a lot of our songs today. Just trying to uh, focus on our praise to him and all the good things he's done for us. I think you can't talk enough about Jesus, so um, we'll sing this song, and then Rick will deliver our message to us today. Jesus is all the world to me. Jesus is all the world to me, my life, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day. Today, without him, I would fall. When I am sad, to him I go. No other one can cheer me so. When I am sad, he makes me glad. He is my friend. Jesus is all the world to me. My friend in trial sore, I go to him for blessings, and he gives them more and more. He sends the sunshine and the rain, he sends the harvest golden grain, sunshine and rain, harvest of grain. Jesus is all the world to me. I want no better friend. I trust him now. I'll trust him when life's fleeting days are in. Beautiful life with such a friend. Beautiful life that has no end. Eternal life, eternal joy, he's my friend. Good morning, everybody. 
Good to be with you. For those of you that are in our uh, Sunday evening class, you may recognize that the text that we are uh, had read for us is exactly where we're getting ready to start off tonight in class. That's for two reasons. One, because I, I had a specific idea in mind that I was wanting to focus on. And two, because I'm stupid and I forgot where we were <laughs> in our class. And so I asked Jeremy, he said, okay, if I focus on one particular part of your class, and he said, yeah, that's fine. He said, Just, you know, unless you do a terrible job, then I'll go back and, and cover it again. <laughs> But there's actually one specific aspect to the text over in Matthew chapter 12 that I would like to, to focus on. And it's one that, that really it resonates in my mind for a number of reasons. Let's go ahead and look back at Matthew 12 and the scripture reading we had just a moment ago, starting in verse 38. And some of the scribes and Pharisees answered, saying, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign. And no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they, are, because they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and indeed a greater than Jonah is here. The Queen of the South will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it. For she came to the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon, and indeed, a greater than Solomon is here. Now, when an unclean spirit goes out of a man, he goes through dry places, seeking rest, and finds none. Then he says, I will return to my house from which I came. And when he comes, he finds it empty, swept, and put in order. Then he goes and takes with him seven other spirits more wicked than himself. And they enter and dwell there. And the last state of that man is worse than the first. So shall it also be with this wicked generation." In this text, Jesus took issue with the unbelief of his generation. He called them evil and adulterous, some really strong words, quite frankly. And he explained his indictment by comparing them to Nineveh and to the Queen of Sheba. And of course, these are both Gentile and Gentile cities who actually believed some in the messages that Yahweh had sent to them. And this is from men who were far lesser than the one speaking, than the Son of God himself. And so these Jews stood condemned by this particular comparison. Then he uses an example which for a number of years when I was younger, I just kind of scratched my head and I thought, what? What is this demon possession thing? And really it has everything to do with, as far as I can tell, Israel's history. Israel was a nation that was repeatedly judged, or to use the language of Jesus' uh, speech here, they were demon or they were exercised, as it were. They had evil driven from them as a nation repeatedly. Guys like Assyria, Babylon, Rome, the Philistines, how many times do we read where God's people are judged by Yahweh for not following his commands? And then you, you read a passage where then God sends a deliverer after 20 years, they repent, and then that generation's good, but then the next generation uh, doesn't, doesn't follow through and ends up having the same problems. Jesus seems to be saying, you guys are like a house that has been, been cleaned up. You've thrown out the, the evil that's in there, the, the house of the heart. You've been demons exercised repeatedly and you have failed to fill your heart with God. Hence evil finds its way back into this empty house. And it's that idea that I'd like to kind of run with this morning and talk just a little bit about something that's very basic. Let's face it, if we are Christians, we have been exercised of of Satan. We have been uh, cleaned from the evil that has been in our hearts through sin. And we understand that, just like with demon possession, the, the rule of the enemy in our lives, the taskmaster that has been the devil, has been a hard one, has been terrible. And Jesus comes along and he washes us clean through his blood. We become Christians and then we, we are, uh, the, the house of our heart has been emptied of that evil. And so it's, it's important for us to think about then kind of, how things work. And it's really this idea that I want to focus on first, the fact that our heart is a house. 
when you look back just a couple of verses in Matthew 12, look at verse uh, 34, when speaking to this, this group of people who were just so stubborn in their unwillingness to believe, he calls them a den of snakes. He says, you brood of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things for out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks? A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good things, and an evil man out of the evil treasure brings forth evil things. The heart of a man is his center. We realize that there is a muscle called a heart, but it is just a part of our physical body. Our heart, our Bible heart, is our center, who we are, our conscience, all those things wrapped up. It's the center of our decision making. It's, it's who we really are. And of course, he's explaining that you can't have, as we talked about in our adult class last week, good things come from a good heart and bad things come from a bad heart. That's ultimately the the rule that we can live by. And so Jesus is teaching that our heart is very much like a home in many respects. There can be good or evil within it. And we understand that since we've all sinned and fallen short, that means that we have dirtied our home with the filth of sin. Listen to a couple passages here in in, uh, rapid succession. 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, starting with verse 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit, by whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison, who formerly were disobedient, when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah while the ark was being prepared, in which a few that is eight souls were saved through water. And there is also an antitype which now saves us. Baptism, not the removing of the filth of the flesh, but the answer of a good conscience towards God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Couple this with what is said in Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 22. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 22. Let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. I think we understand there's a lot of different ways that we can look at this, uh, different passages that the Bible uses to emphasize the, the cleansing that goes on in our hearts, the purifying of the conscience, the purifying of the center of a man. That's what happens through Jesus. Peter talks about how baptism is the culmination of that. And it's, he says, you're not washing away physical dirt like in, in a bath. He says, this is the answer of a good conscience towards God. This is what somebody does when he realizes what God has done for them through Jesus and what the call is. And why is it an answer of a good conscience? Because it's what God told him to do, for starters. He said, be immersed in water for the remission of your sins. And the obedient conscience says, okay, I'm going to do that. That's just a, that's a simple equation and there's more going on there, but and then Hebrews talks about that purifying of the conscience. It's such a, a simple concept, and I don't think I have to explain that very much, but once we have been washed and purified, this house has been cleaned out, and God has told us what should fill the void after that cleansing. Colossians 3, Colossians chapter 3, starting in verse 15. And let the peace of God Rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body, and be thankful. And let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. What sort of heart is Paul describing here, but a heart that is overflowing with grace and thankfulness. He talks about how it's expressed in our singing and that this is the uh, very powerful way in which we connect with each other in our elevating God together in song. But it's it's coming from a heart that understands the gratitude we ought to have. Why? Because we have been cleansed from the incurable disease of sin. I mean, it's supposed to be a death sentence, Right? Sin is a death sentence. I think sometimes we we stop believing that because we think, oh, God will forgive me. But we can't afford to make that mistake, my brothers and sisters. Sin is a death sentence. Only when we turn to God with that pure conscience, 
or come to him with that good conscience, does he purify that conscience and cleanse our hearts? Over in Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 10. This passage coming from the Jeremiah, uh, which was a, a Old Testament snapshot of what the, the kingdom of the Messiah would look like, the difference between physical Israel and what would be spiritual Israel, us, the church. Listen to how he describes the difference. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their mind and write them on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. God's law is to be written in our hearts. This is an intimate knowledge of his will. It's something that we oftentimes are... <coughs> excuse me, I think that's the first time I've ever sneezed preaching. Write that down and throw it in the fire. <coughs> but the, the emphasis being that the law that was written on tablets of stone, but for so many Jewish people never made it to the tablet of their heart, he says that's not going to be the case with this new kingdom. Because every single one of them will have it in their heart. You are born a physical Jew, whether you, you, know, whether you like it or not, that's how you were born. But when you are born a spiritual Jew, it is by your submission, by your choice, Therefore, in order to become this new Israel, you have to know the Lord already. And he goes on to say you won't have to tell everybody, hey, you should know who Yahweh is, because you will already have known him in order to have first been born. There's no being born again without knowing who he is. It's a fundamental part of how this all starts. And I think that's a very important part, because he's saying that the mind and the heart understand God from the get-go of this new birth. Certainly there's a lifetime of growth, but it's not a, uh, you're born and then you learn who he is. You learn who he is and then you are born so that you may follow him. John chapter 14 and verse 23. John chapter 14 verse 23 says, Jesus answered and said to him, If anyone loves me, he will keep my words and my father will love him. And we will come to him and make our home with him. I don't have to explain to anybody how ridiculous it is for someone to say, I love Jesus, and then to ignore everything he says. I mean, we see that. We see a lot of people claim that they are Christians, and we see the way they live their lives. And we look at it and say, well, you know, it's not my job to judge their soul, but I certainly look at the actions, and, and they're not com compliant with what Jesus said. I mean, it's... It's really a simple equation. You love me, you're going to do what I tell you to do. If you love me, you're going to stay away from the things that I despise. I didn't make you to do those things. It's not what I want you to do. I want you to do this. And as parents, we know what it's like when kids play games, right? When we've told them something and they're old enough to understand and they, and they try to, to cut corners and say, well, you didn't actually do this. What do you think I meant by that? And we know that when they're little, that they, they don't extrapolate well, and so we, we handhold them. But when they're teenagers and they pull stunts like that, we beat them. <laughs> we say, no, that's not acceptable. You're grounded for the weekend, or you take away the car keys, or whatever. You know better than that. And yet so often people think, well, I'm just going to find a way to make excuses why I don't have to do what God says. That's not what happens when a heart has been truly exercised. When that evil has been swept away, we are to instill him in our hearts as Lord. We are to make him our king and to do the things that please him. That's how this is supposed to work. But what happens when the house of the heart that gets cleansed stays empty? There's a, a, a phrase I learned from Spock. When I was a kid, Star Trek VI, Out of Discovered Country, Spock says, nature abhors a vacuum. When I was a kid, I thought, what does that mean? But I got a little bit older, and I realized, yeah, he's right. Nature abhors a vacuum. That's kind of a, a proverb, if you will. That nothing stays empty for long, does it? Even in our culture, a house, when it's unlived in for a while, vagrants find their way in, animals, you know, bugs, different things like that. Things don't stay empty for long. The human heart is no different. Something's going to fill you. 
one way or another, it's inevitable. It's going to happen. Don't kid yourself. Jesus says through this idea, this kind of parable, if you will, about the demon-possessed man being exercised. Once that demon got thrown out, what happened? He goes about and walks for a while and says, you know, I can't find any place. I'm going out through the desert, dry places. I'm going to go back and see what my old place looks like. It's still, and you know what? It's not only empty. He's cleaned it up. It's all nice and purty. Hey, guys, come on in. I found a spot. You know what? It's, it's even better than it was. When I left it, it was a dump hole. Now it's all pretty. Come on, let's join. And it's worse for that guy than it was in the beginning. What Jesus is saying is, is if we don't fill that hole, the, the, the house of our heart, with someone, someone will find their way in. And it's not going to be who we think. Once we have been cleansed of our enemy and he's been kicked out, we can't sit void. The heart has to be filled. And it will be filled. That old proverb, idle hands are the devil's workshop. What does that mean? If we stay, uh, I'm not sure what the word is, unbusy is what I'm trying to say, if that's a terrible word. If we stay idle, if we sit there and don't do anything, we know that we, our hands find something to get busy doing, and it's oftentimes destructive and sinful. We know with little children that when you keep them busy, they don't find things to do. They don't find electric light sockets to stick things in. <laughs> you keep them busy, and, and it's, it's a way to kind of control their, their wandering habits. Well, as adults, we're not any different spiritually. We're going to do stuff. We're going to get into stuff. If it's good and it's holy and it's pure, it'll make us better and keep us out of trouble. If we just sit there, Trouble's going to find its way in. When one's eyes have been opened to the truth of God and they turn their back on Him, bad things happen. Look over in Hebrews chapter 3 with me. Hebrews 3. Hebrews 3. Beginning with verse 12. And of course, if you know anything about the, the book of Hebrews, it is a, a long dissertation and encouragement for these Christians to not give up. They're, they're, they're thinking about tossing away their Christianity and giving up. And he says, wait a minute. Don't, don't you understand how good you had it under the law of Moses? Think how much better you have it under Christ. And if you give up on Christ, there's not another dispensation coming. It's not the law of Moses and the law of Christ and then the law of somebody else. This is what we have. This is the Savior. If this isn't good enough for you, I, there's nothing else to offer you. So he says in Hebrews 3, starting in verse, uh, verse 12, Brethren, beware lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief in departing from the living God. But exhort one another daily while it is called today, lest any of you be hardened through the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence steadfast to the end. The writer stressed the need for constant renewal of the heart so that it didn't become hard. It had to keep it soft. I mean, it, I think about anything in this world that gets dried out, you make a nice moist cake. What happens if you leave it uncovered and exposed? I mean, it's, it's going to become dry at some point anyways. But there are things that we, we moist, that we keep moisturized. Things like plants, they dry up, they die. The heart must be kept soft and malleable. God is going to continue to shape you. I don't know if we realize that, but <clears throat> the work isn't over when we are baptized. It's just beginning. And unfortunately, a lot of times, I think people think that you know, they've, they've spent a few decades as baptized believers, and they haven't really changed much or grown much since when they first got dunked in the water. And folks, let me tell you, our God will not accept that. We cannot rest on the fact that we got, got baptized and stopped there because that is, that is your birth. If a child is born into this world and never grows beyond infancy, that child is going to have terrible problems and will die because that's not what it's, it's meant to do. 
we have to continue to progress, which is why we have to fill our hearts with God. Hard hearts come from guys like, you think about Pharaoh, you think about the audience that stoned Stephen, they had hard hearts, they were stubborn, they were resistant to what was right and what was good. I want you to listen to a couple passages here in the book of Hebrews that really scare me. Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews 6, starting with verse 4. And just to kind of set up the, the context a little bit, chapter 5, you remember, it's where he talks about people not growing. He says, you ought to be teachers, but you need to be taught all over again the first principles. And why is that a problem? Because he says at the beginning of chapter 6 that first principles are, are there to be a foundation so you can build something. The Bible tells us that if we simply dine on first principles, God is not pleased. Now let me tell you something. That's one of the things that always concerns me as a preacher, that I don't just simply lay down sermons and, and classes that are just first principle stuff. I've met some preachers who that's all they know, and they're going to have to answer for that before God. It's our responsibility to challenge not only ourselves, but each other as ministers, to challenge us to grow. Yes, we have laid the foundation of baptism and understanding how all these things work together. Now we are to put an edifice up. No one builds a foundation just to build a foundation. It has a purpose. You're going to put a house on that or a building, shed, something. If all you have is a foundation, you have nothing in the end. Because God expects an edifice to go there. Something to be erected upon that foundation that will glorify Him. Hebrews chapter 6, so having said all that, now let me read. Hebrews 6, beginning verse 4. For it's impossible for those who were once enlightened and have tasted the heavenly gift and have become partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come, if they fall away to renew them again to repentance, since they crucify again for themselves the Son of God and they put him to an open shame. Jump over to chapter 10. Chapter 10, a passage we're also very familiar with, having talked about the, the need to assemble together and encourage each other. Hebrews 10, verse 26, he says, For if we sin willfully after we've received the knowledge of the truth, there's no longer remains a sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation which will devour the adversaries. Anyone who rejected Moses' law died without mercy under the testimony of two or three witnesses. Of how much worse punishment do you suppose Will he be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot, counted the blood of the covenant which he was sanctified a common thing, and insulted the Spirit of grace? For he who has said, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord, and again the Lord will judge his people. These two passages are, are strong. Now, I don't want to get too far off, off course here, but Hebrews uh, 4 in particular talks about it's impossible for these people to, to be forgiven and recognize that the impossibility there is not that there is some sin that God will never forgive in them, but rather that it's impossible to renew them again to repentance. People get to a point, the writer is saying, where they simply are so hard-hearted hearted, that no one can encourage them anymore to do the right thing. They simply will not listen. It will only come from them. In our in our common vernacular, there's a word for that. It's called a narcissist. One of the things I have learned by having narcissists in, in my family is that a narcissist, there is no drugs to give them. There's no counseling. Until they realize they are broken, until they realize that the problem is them and them alone, they will, there's nothing anyone can do. And that's so maddening. When you're dealing with that, because you love that person, you want good things for them, but they just will not change. Only they can change. Well, basically, a narcissist is just another word for a hard-hearted sinner, <laughs> isn't it? The Bible has talked about that long before we even put that word into our vernacular, before English ever existed. Someone who says, I know what God has offered, and I don't want it anymore. Until that person changes their heart, there's nothing anybody else can do. And that is difficult. So that's the impossibility. The impossibility is none of us can go and say something or do something that will change them. They alone, they are so hard-hearted, 
that no testimony from the scriptures, no word from you, it's them or nothing. And God says, until they humble themselves, there's no forgiveness. And that's always true, isn't it? But that people can be so hardened. That's why our heart must stay malleable. We must not cut off and say, I'm not going to listen. When, when a brother or sister comes to us and says, hey, Rick, I'm concerned about wh what you're doing here. I think there's a problem here. And if our answer is to simply say, what kind of arrogance do you think you've got coming and trying to encourage me and tell me this thing? That's a hard heart. A soft heart will say, well, I don't agree with you, but I appreciate you reaching out. I appreciate that you love me enough to say something. The hard heart mocks and ridicules and flicks them off like they're just a, a bug bothering you on a beautiful picnic day. The soft heart will at least say, well, I, I hear what you're saying. I, I don't agree with that, but I'm willing to listen. What kind of heart do we have? Are we so secure in what we think we know that no one can help us? Hebrews 4 or Hebrews 6 and Hebrews 10 tells us what kind of person you are if that's who you are. You're somebody that no one can encourage. No one can help you to repent. You have shut everyone else out. That's the kind of thing that happens when we exercise evil from our lives and don't fill it with God. God will keep our heart malleable because he's always reshaping it. But if I am stone cold and I know what I know, that's not a malleable heart anymore. And sometimes we go through periods of time where we may be hardened. And I know I've had that in my life where I've, I've been certain about certain things and I felt confident and then finally God broke through and I realized, oh man, was that dumb. Was I fooling myself? We recognize the need for continued growth. And if we don't fill our hearts with God, it will be filled with something else, someone else, and that he will dry out our hearts so fast that it will be like stone. And that doesn't do anybody any good. <laughs> well, thinking about the difficulties of how this all plays out. I want to encourage us, and I, I didn't want to stay on that. There we go. I want to encourage us to think about some things that our hope will encourage us. Look over in 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. I don't know why it's titled that way. What happens when our heart house isn't filled? I'm not quite sure why I titled it that way. That's a bad title. This is more positive now. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 15. But sanctify the Lord God, or sanctify Jesus as Lord in your hearts, and always be ready to give a defense to everyone who asks you a reason for the hope that is in you with meekness and fear. Sanctify Christ as Lord in your hearts. What does that mean? Well, first off, it means enthrone the Savior as the Master. We've all probably recognized the struggle that, that folks have with accepting the dual nature of Jesus. And I don't mean God and man, I mean Savior and King. We just got through singing a song, He's my King, and celebrating that. But you know what? I think a lot of people, when they think about that, are, are kind of, they don't like that idea. They don't like the idea of, of submitting to someone of having a sort of connection to a superior. They, they want Jesus' salvation, but they don't want his lordship. They don't want him telling them what to do. I'll tell myself what I do, thank you very much, and God will just deal with it. That's what people are saying with their lives. Well, maybe not with their, with their mouths, but I'm going to do what I'm going to do, and I'll take my chances. When you love somebody, you don't say stuff like that. If there's a possibility that something, that I'm thinking that something might offend my wife, I ask her. Or I simply don't do it at all. But I don't say, well, you know what, I'll take my chances that this might break her heart. That this might hurt her. That's not what love does. Love says, I'll check 
or I won't do it at all. But we don't say, I'll take my chances. That's arrogant, that's presumptuous, that's hard-hearted. That's not what someone who loves someone will do, is it? But yet we do that with God. Men do that with God millions of times a day. I'll take my chances. Oh yeah, I, I think God's important. I need him. I want to be my savior. But the Bible says that this, that God hates this, or that God doesn't like this, or this, this disappoints him. Well, I mean, it, it's kind of who I am. But doesn't it concern you that you'll stand before him and that he's going to be upset? Well, I guess we'll see. No. We're not just talking about standing before the judge. We're talking about standing before the greatest lover of your soul. That no one loves you and has done more for you or as much for you as him. And that's the approach we take. That's criminal, isn't it? That's criminal. Unfortunately, but that's what sin, Satan encourages us to do. To take that sort of approach. Over in Psalm 119, we, we won't read it uh, for time's sake, but over in Psalm 119, verses 97 to 104, that whole section, and of course the whole psalm is about the Word of God, right? And we understand that, a huge psalm emphasizing God's Word. But he talks about how God's Word, God's statutes, how they illuminate his life, how they make his life better, how he loves them, how he cherishes them. That's what we need to be working towards. The law of God, the Word of God, is the mind and heart of God. And we need that in our lives. Let me tell you something. My, my life, my, my work, everything I've ever been as an adult has been about this book. And yet, I, I, I know in my heart that I don't spend enough time with this. And this is, this is between me and God. You know, I'm not going to compare my, my usage to you or anybody else. This is what Rick knows, that this should be more important than it is sometimes. And you think you're a preacher, you have to spend all that time in, in the Word. You know, these sermons and classes don't just fall from the sky, and that's true. And yet, I, I know this is the heart of the one who loves me. This is his mind. Why don't I want more of it? And I struggle with that, and I suspect I will struggle with it to the day I die, that I, I, I can't get enough of God, and yet, I don't go to Him enough. <laughs> Why do I do that? And maybe you're in the same boat. Maybe we all can look at that and say, we, we should want to spend more time. This isn't about how much time, you know, a preacher man, how much time should I spend studying my Bible every day? I will never have an answer for that. The only answer I can give you is the one I give myself, and that's more how much time? More than what you're giving. Not that you're wrong or sinning, but it's, it's an, ex, an inexhaustible source of love and encouragement and correction and instruction. And it's how he thinks. It's how he responds. It's what he loves. It's what he despises. And it is his heart. And the writer of Psalm 119 and guys like David understood that God's word is his heart. It's who he is. And if you're like me, I need to spend more time in his word. I need that. You need that. Not that we have failed to reach some checklist where God says, oh, Rick, Rick's not there yet, so I'm not going to save him. That's not what that's about. It's about, is Rick striving to know me more? God's inexhaustible, right? God is the ocean and we are you know, the, the little uh, communion cups that we just drank out of, right? Just pull that up and, oh, I've got, I'm filled up to the brim with God. And then you look and there's an entire ocean. Whoa. But don't you want more? Those little cups of grape juice? They're not very much. My wife and I, when we remember, we bring one of those bigger ones, and she takes a few sips, and I chug the rest of it. <laughs> I'm always thirsty, and I love grape juice. I want more than those tiny little cups. And Jerry, I'm not picking on you, brother. <laughs> I want more of that. 
And if, if I love God, I want more than, than what I'm currently able to contain. The beauty of it is, is that the more I drink from him, the more he expands my cup. But I'm never going to be so big that I can take all of him in. That's the beauty of it. God can say, Rick, keep on coming. And there's an endless amount of him. But why doesn't that thrill me more? Because my heart needs more work. I'm still growing and I'm still trying to, to get better. And it's not that I am not pleasing to him. But it's the parent whose child is just starting to walk, who's taken a few steps, the parent is thrilled, and what do they do? Come on. The baby coddles. Come on. What are you doing in that? Are you upset that, well, they haven't gone far enough, so I'm going to no, you're thrilled, and you want them to keep coming because they're improving, they're growing, they're developing, and that's what our God wants, and this is the key to that. The key to filling our hearts with what will keep us malleable and keep out the bad dude and his minions from our lives. Proverbs 13, verse 20. One of those just simple, short statements that too often I know I forget. Proverbs 13, verse 20. He who walks with wise men will be wise, but the companion of fools will be destroyed. One way in which we can fill our hearts, we've talked about the Word of God, talk about God's people. The first century church puts us to shame when it comes to how much time they spend together, doesn't it? <laughs> I mean, I can't help but read it and think, oh, man, they spent a lot of time together. You know, they all must have smelled really good. And they all must have made really good potluck food or something. <laughs> they, they had all things in common. They were together on, on a regular basis. And I look at that and I envy that, but I'm also kind of, you know, well, I love my brethren, but every day, right? You probably think that about me. If I had to see that dude's face every day, <laughs> I'm not so sure about that. I recognize that the more brothers and sisters spend time together, the more they have in common, the stronger it will be. Why? Is there some magic that happens between us? No. If, if for no other reason, then there's a fundamental understanding of each other's needs. You know, it's, it's one of the great criticisms. I was just with together with some Christians yesterday uh, from another congregation, a bunch of guys, and they were talking about a, a fellow that, that was feeling kind of left out. Uh, even though he's contacted a lot, there, there are people who've got needs and things like that that need to be met. And, and, and one of the frustrations that was mentioned as well, they don't let me know or they don't tell me that they've got these needs. They just complain. And of course, the, the yes, we need to communicate. But of course, by being together more, that communication just kind of naturally happens. But we have to take the time to, to spend time together. And I'm, I'm thankful for, especially as COVID is breaking, that we're getting more opportunities to spend time together and do things. Uh, it's just wonderful. I, I enjoy it, and I think most of us enjoy it as, as well. But it, it's a necessity for our growth and our development, for us to get stronger and to become more and more of what we are as a family. The, the wise man, he picks his friends well. And let me tell you, there is no greater friend you can pick than your brother or sister in Christ. That our preference for one another is its fundamental to our, our success. People who isolate themselves, you know, who have the attitude of, I don't need my brothers and sisters. I don't, they're not successful. Their lives are lonely and broken. And of course, we have people who, who can't be together, who might be watching this morning, who aren't able to get out and do those things, and, and it's hard for them. And I'm guilty myself of forgetting that and not being more on top of reaching out and encouraging people. I just I get caught up in my own selfishness. But being together, as we experienced through COVID when we weren't able to, was hard. It was very hard. And it weakened us, didn't it? It, it, it weakened me 
by not being able to be together with you all the time. We made the best of it, but I was not better for that, were you? You know, we, we made the best of a tough situation. But I need you. I need you. Desperately, I need you. My family needs you. And hopefully, I can be useful enough that you can say, yeah, I, I need Rick too from time to time. And what a beautiful thing it is to have that reciprocation and that, that love and that joy. It's such a powerful thing. Psalm 101. Psalm 101, verses 3 and 4. I will set nothing wicked before my eyes. I hate the work of those who fall away. I shall not, it shall not cling to me. A perverse heart shall depart from me. I will not know wickedness. There, there is a need for us to be careful with what we see. So we've talked about filling our hearts with God's word. We've talked about filling our lives with God's people. And let's, let's not fill our eyes with, with junk. It's hard. Junk is everywhere. Things that encourage us and, and encourage evil, that glorify evil. I mean, it's everywhere. We find shows that we like, and yet there, there's the constant innuendo. Nowadays, it's constantly being crammed on our throat. Uh, homosexuality and all sorts of the various lettered abominations that come from that. Things that God says, you know, I hate this stuff. And man's like, I don't care. Let me shove it down your throat. I mean, it's everywhere. And it's frustrating. But we have to have a, a, an understanding that, that we have got to watch what we watch and what we listen to. That we've got to be able to find ways to draw lines. You know, I'm the kind of person, uh, uh, I have, I was exposed to pornography when I was very, very young. A friend, uh, best friend had a, a, a parent who had stashes of it. And so when I was about eight or nine, we found them. And so pornography has always been something that I have to watch constantly. And I have to have my wife constantly help me. When there's something that pops up on TV that's inappropriate, make sure I'm looking away or remind me, hey, don't watch that. That we have to, I have to police myself. And that's, I suspect a lot of guys have to do that. But we can't just say, oh, well, you know, it's, it is where it is. No, don't put that in front of you. Look away. Or if it's something, it's a show that is notorious for that, don't watch that. There are things that we have to do and sacrifices that we'll have to make to make sure we're not putting wicked things before our eyes. Because I don't know about you, but for me, wicked things oftentimes are very tantalizing in the way they look. Not just naked women, but things and stuff that are glorifying habits that, you know, maybe I kind of wish I could do. No, you don't put that. It's like, it's like a guy who's a recovering alcoholic. He doesn't go to the bar. That's the worst place he can possibly go. What's that going to do? Well, I'm not going to drink. Yes, but you're in a place where that's all people do. <laughs> and we would say, you, you can't do that. That's nuts. And yet, don't we do the equivalent with the things we put before our eyes in a lot of times? Where we're basically saying, I struggle with this, but that's okay. I'll, I'll, I'll withstand the temptation. No! We can't do that. And I'm not going to sit here and tell you what you can and can't watch. That, that's so far above my understanding. But what I can tell you is when you know yourself, hopefully well enough to know the things that are going to tempt you, the things that are going to make it harder for you to be right with God, get rid of that stuff. Get away from it. Don't put it before you. And we can be successful. We can remove things that are going to make it more difficult to be successful. We go the route of Philippians 4 where we put things that are good, pure, holy, and such. And then we will be much more successful. And there's, I'm sure, a lot of other things that we could, we could cite about putting, putting these good things into our hearts. But I think we've at least got a, a good start with filling our hearts with God's word and filling his, our hearts with God's people. But it has to start with the cleansing, doesn't it? If you have not yet been baptized, your heart is filled with evil. If, if you've sinned, if you know you've sinned, then there is evil in your heart. And it must be dealt with. 
It must be exercised. And so we encourage you this morning to wash away your sins in the blood of the Lamb, in Jesus Christ, the baptism that He has authorized. Repent and be baptized. That's what we are told in Scripture repeatedly. And that's what you need to do. And once your heart has been cleansed, now you can start down the path of righteousness and continue to hold to God. And for those of us, the majority of us here have been baptized. What does your heart look like? Have you had struggles filling it with God? Have you left it empty? <laughs> and has it been empty enough that the enemy is finding a way to sneak back in? God will forgive you. He will wash you clean again in that forgiveness. And we can, 1 Peter 3.15, we can enthrone Jesus and put him where he belongs. You can do that now. If that's something that we can help you with, we encourage you to come forward. But whatever your needs might be, my brother, my sister, my friend, make Jesus the Lord of your life right now. Why don't you come as we stand and sing? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. It's all about. <clears throat> Gracious Father, we praise you for the day, for the strength to be out this morning. We praise you for Christian fellowship, for the ability to meditate on your word and just come to acknowledge who you are and who we are in comparison. Father, we praise you as the creator of this world. We praise you for your wisdom. We praise you for your creativity, and your ability to make all of this that we see and experience. We praise you for your wisdom. Uh, 
We praise you for your compassion, for your love, for your desire to have fellowship with us. And for that, Father, we thank you and praise you for your patience and your mercy and grace, for giving us time in this life to recognize that life with, with you, without you, life under the sun, is meaningless. We are thankful for all the many blessings of life, for the joys that you bless us with. Uh, we're thankful for your redemptive power and for your... Um, we just come to recognize that even though their life is filled with many good things, it's ultimately futile if it is not if we don't have fellowship with you. And so we're thankful for our Savior Jesus and for what he did for us. We are eternally in debt to him for the sacrifice that he made on the cross to allow us to be free from guilt and from sin. And we're thankful for the message that our brother brought to us today. And that while we can be cleansed and emptied of the control of Satan, that's not enough, Father, and we just pray thankful that we can be reminded of the importance to be filled with you and your spirit. And we pray that we might be intent on that, Father, that we'd fill our minds with good things, good things from your word, good things from encouragement that we hear from one another. Uh, we pray that <clears throat> we would be suitable, uh, our hearts would be a suitable dwelling place for you in your spirit, that we would uh, keep Satan out and uh, uh, not allow that spirit to come back into us, but that we might be vigilant about that and making sure that we're sanctifying uh, Jesus as Lord of our lives and that we might want more, that we might not be just content to have a little bit, but that we would constantly be uh, seeking more of you more of your character, more of your good works, and that that might be our life's work, is to just be getting closer and closer to you. Uh, we're thankful for these thoughts. Pray that we might meditate on them, take them with us as we go home, and pray that you just be with each and every part member of this congregation. We pray for our young people. We pray for the older folks. We pray for everyone in between, Father. Pray that you would bless this fellowship and help us to grow more like your son Jesus. We pray and ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Trust and obey. That's how we uh, fill our, the house of our heart. Sometimes you just got to trust God and do what he says. <clears throat> when we walk with the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory sheds on our way. What we do is good will. He abides with us still. And with all who will trust and obey. Trust and obey. For the snow of the way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Not a shadow can rise, not a cloud in the skies, but a smile directly drives it away. Not a doubt or a not a sigh or a tear can abide while we trust and obey. Trust and obey for the snow of the way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Not a burden we bear, nor a sorrow we share, but our toil he doth richly repay. 
Not a grief or a loss, not a frown or a cross, but is blessed if we trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no Jesus, but to trust and obey. But we never can prove the delights of His love until all on an altar we lay for the favor He shows. And the joy bestows up for those who will trust and obey. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Then in fellowship sweet, we will sit at His feet, or we'll walk by His side in the way. What He says we will do, where He says, we will go, never fear, only trust and obey, trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey.